Thank you all very much today for joining us for the first of what will be three webinars on marine biofouling and more about that later. This morning, our subject is biocide use in anti-fouling coatings, the regulatory framework. And these webinars are being jointly hosted by the Singapore National Biofilms Consortium, PML Applications Limited and the National Biofilms Innovation Centre. My name is Mark Richardson and I'm the CEO of the National Biofilms Innovation Centre. Our agenda today, which should come up in a second, is two presentations. The first by um, Shiba San. Just excuse me, my slide isn't moving on. So the purpose of today is to give an overview of the current status and pending direction in the regulatory framework from both the Asian and European perspective. Um, two talks today, as I've said, each lasting approximately 20 minutes. We will then have a Q&A session. And we ask, as you look at your screen now, you will see a Q&A box. We ask, as you think of questions during these presentations, please put the Q&A, the questions you may have in those boxes. And at the end of the session, um, my colleagues, from the UK, um, Will Green from National Biofilms Innovation Centre and Tom Vance from PML will handle questions and answers with the party, with the speakers. As I say, the first is Shiba San and the second will be Jeff Mackerel of Teal and Mackerel Limited. So first of all, I'd like to hand over to Stefan Kellberg from the Singapore National Biofilms Centre to introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Mark. Um, and, and uh, just to introduce myself, uh, I'm uh, the director of CELSI, which is Singapore Center for Environmental Life Sciences Engineering, and also the Singapore National Biofilm Consortium. And I have the pleasure then to introduce to you the first speaker of today, which is uh, Mr. Tomoyoshi Shiba from, from Japan. So Shiba-san has, um, as a way of introduction of, of Shiba-san's profile, has over 11 years of experience in leading global chemical regulatory activities of Chuguku marine paints. And um, his area of expertise includes uh, notification and registration of new chemicals or anti fouling paint products in various regions, both in the EU region as well as in the Asia Pacific. And that includes Korea, China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Philippines, and, and Australia. And he also specializes in the, the application of paint products to classification societies, such as Class and K and Lloyd's Register of, of Shipping. And since 2011, Shiba-san has been very actively involved in ISO projects. He was part of, of the working group that established and published a series on marine environmental risk assessment methods for anti fouling and anti-fouling paints. And uh, he is currently leading a project um, for a draft series on bioassay methods for screening and defiling paints. It does that also as a convener of the working group five. So Shiba San, welcome and, and over to you. So thank you, Stefan San. Uh, hello, everyone. I am uh, Tomoyoshi Chiba. I am working at uh, Chiyoku Marine Paints, one of the marine paint manufacturers based in Japan. Also, I'm convener of an ISO working group. I'm very honored to have such an opportunity to make a presentation today. So let, uh, let me share my presentation. The title of my presentation is Biocide Use in anti fouling Coatings, the Regulatory Framework in Asia. I would like to introduce some more information from the paint manufacturer's point of view. My presentation consists of three parts. First part is a very basic information. What is anti fouling paint and why is it necessary? I run through it quickly. Second part is international regulation, EFS convention. 
And the last part is local regulation in Asia, uh, main point of my presentation. There are uh, various kinds of marine species trying to attach on a ship's hull during ship's operation. Here are typical marine sexual organisms, uh, seaweed, barnacles, mussels, and so on. Uh, the lines in this map show sea lanes. Uh, red, uh, red thick lines means many methods come and go. Uh, for example, between Europe and the United States or among Asian countries. I believe that the uh, hull of almost all vessels are coated with antifaring paint. However, what if antifaring paints are not effective enough. One of the biggest uh, problems is uh, transfer of non-indigenous species. Once uh, marine organisms have attached to ship's hull, accidental introduction of non-indigenous species to another marine environment could happen, which may cause significant change in the local ecosystem. For example, uh, Japanese seaweed called wakame is originally seen in Japan. But it is now a typical example of non-indigenous species found in Australia or New Zealand. Another problem relates to fuel consumption and GHG emission. According to the third IMO GHG study 2014, over the period of uh, 2007 to 2000, uh, 2012, average annual fuel consumption ranged between about uh, 247 million and 325 million tons consumed by all ships. That, uh, that accounted for about 3.1% over uh, annual global CO2 emission. Regarding the influence of biofouling on fuel consumption, an article of Polish maritime research says extreme severe hull biofouling can increase hull resistance by as much as 40%. At the same time, reducing its speed by two knots. The corresponding increase of fuel consumption amount to 20%. So uh, I can say that biofiring has close relation to fuel consumption and GHG emission. The purpose of anti-firing paints is to prevent sexual organisms from attaching on ship's hull. However, the suitability of anti-firing paint varies depending on ship design, operational profile or maintenance regimes and other factors. Therefore, marine paint manufacturers, uh, Chiyoko marine paints, of course, uh, supplied multiple types, types of anti-firing paint responding to a variety of uh, conditions. Many of anti-firing paints have one active substance or more, and they are designed to release antifirants gradually into marine environment during service life. From the environmental safety or workplace safety point of view, some countries have specific regulations on antifirants or antifiring paint. Uh, please note that uh, antifirant is also called active substance, active ingredient, or biocide. But uh, let me use the term antifirant here, unless otherwise specified by uh, regulations I introduce. There are many regulations, requirements, and guidelines related to antifiring paints. I've already covered fuel consumption and GHG emission. They are not directly related to anti-firing paints, 
but they have close relation with biofouling. And about biofouling, I have, uh, we have the guidelines for control and management of ships biofouling, adopted in July uh, 2011. The review of the guideline is being discussed at IMO. At the top left, International Convention on the Control on Harmful Anti-Fouling Systems on Ships 2001, uh, abbreviated, ab abbreviated to AFS Convention, will be briefly explained uh, with the next slide. At the bottom left, uh, some countries, including in Asian countries, have regulations for industrial chemical substances and uh, other countries have special rules for products, including anti foreign paints. I'll introduce them later. So paint manufacturers or users need to pay attention to those regulations or requirements. But uh, it's not easy at all because new regulations or amendment of old regulations keep coming. Uh, AFS convention was adopted at the IMO assembly in October 2001 and entered into force in September 2008. As of now, the convention prohibits the use of uh, ornamental compounds only, but Addition of another organic antifoulant, cybertrin, is now discussed at IM. As uh, local regulations in Asia, uh, I've introduced the regulations in Korea, Malaysia, and Hong Kong. They have their own regulations. In addition, I'm going to cover the unique scheme in Japan. Japan doesn't have a special law on anti fouling paint or anti fouling but regulate anti fouling in a different manner. In Korea, the Act on the Registration and Evaluation of Chemicals, so called K REACH, came into force on 1st January 2015. The list of five, 510 priority existing chemical substances called PECs, uh, including the anti fouling shown in the table in the slide, uh, was officially announced. PECs needed to be registered before 1st July uh, 2018. However, under the pressure for stricter regulation, New regulatory scheme was sought for referring to uh, EU BPR. On 1st January 2019, uh, Consumer Chemical Products and Biocide Safety Act, so called KBPR, came into force. Originally, uh, notification of uh, biocides. So the term biocide is used here. Uh, biocides, notification biocides, including anti uh, was required by the end of June uh, 2019. But a part of the regulation was amended. And uh, now late notification is possible. The table shows uh, notified anti under and uh, KDPR. So uh, eight anti were uh, originally picks under K reach. And uh, six substances uh, additionally notified under KBPR. And among them, two substances uh, notification has not been carried out. Antifaurants have a great period of 10 years. That means anti fouling need to be approved by the end of 2029. And anti fouling paint products need to be approved by uh, 2031. Please note that regarding the notified active substances, application plan needs to be submitted uh, by the end of this year. So uh, please don't miss it.
Malaysia. In Malaysia, Pesticides Act 1974 is implemented by the Pesticide Board under the responsibility of the Department of Agriculture. Under uh, the Act, active ingredient is defined uh, as an ingredient listed in the first schedule. And pesticide means A, any substance that contains an active ingredient, or B, any preparation, mixture, or material that contains uh, any one or more of the active ingredients as one of its constituents. Under this act, approval process for some antifouls is ongoing. Whether the, the antifouling paints need to be registered or not is uh, still under discussion. Uh, Malaysian Paint Manufacturers Association has co uh, communicated uh, with the board uh, on this matter. Hong Kong. A pesticide ordinance, Chapter 133, was introduced to regulate the import, manufacture, repackage, or storage, uh, labeling, and sale of all pesticides there. Antifiring anti paints are covered by the ordinance. Only registered or permitted uh, pesticides may be imported and distributed for use. Because a pesticide permit is effectively only for six months. So uh, registration would be uh, preferable, I think. It's uh, interesting that the, the authority, Agriculture, Fishery, and Conservation Department, has a special page for anti fouling paint in their website. So by clicking the link, you'll find uh, this table indicating registered combination of anti -fouls. So registration is needed for every combination of anti -fouls. After the completion of registration, anti paints using those anti can be imported or disputed, as long as the content are uh, equal to or lower than the maximum concentration specified in the table. In the other Asian countries uh, like China, Taiwan, or the Philippines have their own existing chemical inventories. Here is a part of inventory of existing chemical substances in China. This is a website for Taiwan existing chemical substance inventory. And here is a part of a Philippine inventory of chemicals and chemical substances as uh, they have no special law uh, on anti or anti paint, we should focus on whether all the, in, the, the ingredients, including anti are registered there. We can check one by one uh, through uh, their inventories. In Japan, the, uh, as I said, uh, there is no special law uh, on anti or anti paints. Those are regulated under chemical substance control law. However, the risk of anti is evaluated once they are designated as a priority assessment chemical substances called PACs. The table, a part of the notice, shows that kappa cyocyanate, sorry, a little in Japanese, uh, but it shows that uh, kappa cyocyanate was designated as a PAC in December 2013. So how to assess the risk of anti -fouls? In Japan, there was no risk assessment method or scheme when the new evaluation scheme was introduced in uh, 2011. So Japan Paint Manufacturers Association, JPMA, has actively communicated with the Japanese government and suggested a way forward to predict the environmental concentration of an anti fouled JPM suggested to use MAMPEC model, widely used marine anti fouled model, and the government has accepted. On the other hand, 
uh, model harbors or port for risk assessment in Japan are still under discussion. The table shows a list of antifoulants designated as PACs. So uh, three substances were already removed from the list because their quantity are, are small. On the other hand, kappa pyrifion and gikapyrifion will be further evaluated in uh, 2022 or later. So as I mentioned, there are many things uh, we need to consider in order to uh, manufacture, uh, import, supply, use antifouling pins. It's a very complicated work, and sometimes there doesn't seem to be a solution. However, I believe we should explore, explore a well-balanced approach by communicating with all the parties related. At the end of my presentation, let me introduce uh, ISO activity I have been uh, joining. ISO TC8SC2 is a subcommittee to deal with international standards for marine environment protection. In the subcommittee, Working Group 5 is handling standards related to anti fouling pins. So uh, ISO, uh, the Working Group 5 established ISO 13073 series. This, those series, this series describe marine environment or human health risk assessment method. They were developed to support the users who want to evaluate the risk of anti fouling anti fouling or anti fouling paint. Now, I, uh, ISO 21716 series, by USA method for screening anti fouling paints uh, at the final stage for publication. The photos were taken in Kyoto, Japan, when SC2 and WG5 meetings were held last year. I hope, I sincerely hope, ISO TC8, SC2, WG5 could be one of the plat uh, good platforms to discuss anti fouling paint issues among experts from all over the world. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Tomoyoshi, for your presentation. Could I remind you about the opportunity to ask questions of our two speakers today? You will see at the bottom of your screen the Q&A box, and you can ask questions there at any time during this session. And at the end, we will have the opportunity for a Q&A session. OK. Um, and secondly, just like to record, uh, remind all attendees that we will be, we are recording this session, and we will get notified of a link to the um, recording of the webinar once it's available. And any questions we're unable to answer during the session, these will, these will be answered afterwards with the kind grace of our, our presenters. So it's my pleasure now to introduce our second speaker, um, who's Jeff Mackerel of Teal, Teal and Mackerel Limited. And Jeff has long experience at both the user level in this field, all the way through to the main board of a company operating in the field. He's the chairman of the UK Marine Coatings Group, of the British Coat Federation. Jeff is a chemist by background um, and he's been in this industry for over 25 years so he's seen much experience and I'm sure he's going to be able to give us the breadth of his experience today. So Jeff thank you very much for your for coming on and talking to us today and I'll hand over to you to introduce your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much Mark and uh, good morning to everybody. I'll um put my presentation up on the screen, I hope. Uh, can people see that? Yeah. Got it? Yeah, good, okay. We can see the NBIC website, thank you very much. <laughs> we got, okay. you, we can see the screen. Yeah. Okay. It's on the wrong area, there you go. So um, let's just start by getting this up. So good morning. As Mark says, my name's Jeff Mackerel, um, and I've been in this business for 
a very long time, which uh, may be a bit sad, but a little bit about our business to start with, if I can just introduce that. We've been manufacturing coatings for well over 100 years. Uh, we do a lot of specialist brands, specialist products all over the world, um, based in the northeast of the UK. And obviously, those are our business values, customer service, development, innovation, professionalism, and enthusiasm, which you need a lot of when you're dealing with the European Biocidal Products Directive. Um, some standards and awards we've got, ISO 9000, Coatings Care. Anyway, enough of that. We've been there a long time. Um, we've been in it a long time. So the Biocidal Product Regulations, and I'm going to talk slightly differently today. Um, about the impact that this has had on our business or on a SME business. When the EU biocidal regulations came out in 2012, it was a very admirable and um, desirable approach, a level playing field for regulation on biocides across the whole of Europe, taking into account a number of specific areas, which I'll come on to, human health, environmental impact, storage stability, and to make sure that with all, within all these criteria that the product still functioned. So an admirable objective and the act itself, and I'm talking very specifically about this European act, is split into a number of product types of which anti-fouling's are PT21, which is product type 21. A little bit about actives, although that's not our field, obviously as a manufacturer of coatings, we use actives. Um, we don't manufacture them, but these are the materials that we put into anti-fouling paints that make them functions, make them function properly. The manufacturers of actives submit dossiers, in other words, gatherings of information into a central European database to support the evaluation on environmental effects, human health storage, and again, to make sure it works. So, The available actives for PT21 products, anti-foulings, has been shrinking, as I'll come on to later, because of the costs of conforming with the regulation, which are very large. You need to be, econo you need to be able to economically justify why you continue to manufacture an active. There was an excess of 20 available for anti-foulings um, before this act came through. Now the list has gone below five, and there are restrictions on what you can do with some products. For example, it might restrict the, the use of the end product, the anti-fouling to professional use. So the number of tools we have available to do the job is decreasing. So the process to get an authorization for anti-fouling's product type 21. Firstly, you've got to select the products you want to support. And the reason for that selection process will become clear later, I hope. You've got to gather the information that you require. You've got to assemble that information into a dossier. I put that in inverted commas. That's what it's being referred to under BPR, a dossier of information and submit that information to the European Chemicals Association. You then have to react to information requests from the association, from, from ECHA and provide more information if, if necessary. And hopefully at the end of the process, you achieve a product authorization for sale of the product within Europe or within certain parts of Europe, depending on how you've applied. The information you need to get together is you have to prove the efficacy of the product. You have to assess through various criteria the hazard it presents to human health. You have to look at the hazards it presents to the environment and you have to make sure that the product stays stable and is what it was two years after you filled it into a container. You don't want it to mature, mature like a claret, unfortunately. I wish in some ways it would. What's involved? Well, some information, I mean, how do you action this? How do you go ahead and do it? Well, you have to go and gather the information from the raw material suppliers. And a lot of information is available through them because obviously they wish to supply you with the product. You're their customer. And secondly, they've also been through this process to get their active ingredients approved. 
there is some specific test data that you will need to gather. And when you gather that information, it generally has to be done by a laboratory with GLP certification, General Laboratory Practice Certification, which means it conforms to certain standards and there are a limited number of laboratories that have that criteria. You will probably, if you are an SME uh, or a medium-sized business, you'll probably need an external consultant to complete and submit the dossier for, for the European regulation because it is incredibly laborious and incredibly complicated. So unless you allocate resources specifically, you'll need to employ somebody else. So once you've gathered the dossier, you've got the data together, you've submitted to ECHA, who actually assesses the product? Well, one of the EU competent authorities, and there's one in each EU country. Unfortunately, the charges they put forward vary, uh, the approach and capabilities vary, and sometimes, in some cases, they might use outside consultants to do the work. So what data is required and acceptable? Well, it's quite clearly written, and this is part of the complication of the regulation, um, but it's still being interpreted. So what information is required and what depth of information and quite to what level and what the criteria and the parameters are, are still being assessed by the competent authorities. It's a tremendously complex piece of regulation, and this tends to lead to uncertainty and leads to excess cost. So what is the direct impact on one family? I say one family, that's one group of products, one formulation, which might be available in different tin sizes and different, current, different colors, but it's based on the same, um, same chemical structure, the formulation. So how does that affect one formulation? In effect, it produces legal uncertainty. We've not yet identified a clear cut process of achieving approval. And it also creates commercial uncertainty because obviously raw material suppliers are reviewing their portfolio of products quite understandably given the cost of achieving approval. The direct impact again, extra costs you've got. What are they gonna be? The development costs. You've got data gathering costs, you've got registration costs, and you've got consultants costs. That's if you're using one. So, and also, what is the time frame for the approval? This regulation, particularly in Europe, has been going since 2014, so it's a long time. Applications to ECHA, I'm going to give you some specific costs here for this one product family, which we applied for. Uh, I think it was 14 individual country approvals. So you've got to apply to the competent authority in the first place. So that costs 47,000 pounds. That was the price of, a, of identifying one competent authority to do the primary work and the mutual recognition work in the other countries to which we also applied. So 47,000 pounds just before you started. This is obviously UK cost, competent authority, processing costs. And this is where there's a tremendous inconsistency. One competent authority will charge you a thousand euros, another one will charge you a hundred thousand euros. You then have the consultants fees to do the administration, which could be in excess of 50. And one of the quotes we got was 250,000 pounds. And don't get me wrong, all the people we've worked with all the people we've worked with in this process have been very helpful and very constructive. It's just the costs and the uncertainty. The tests for GLP standard, dermal penetration, which everybody probably listening to this call will know, will cost you 40 to 50,000 pounds. So far, this one product family has cost 70,000 pounds. So these are direct costs. 47,000 for the application, 100,000 or a cost for the company to try to do the work, consultants fees, GLP standards or standard data gathering. So there's no guarantee of an authorization at the end of that cost. And costs in terms of time. Well, again, I'm talking one product family for the biosilo product regulations in the, in the EU. Eight years of two staff, 20% of the time. So you can put an estimated figure of 140,000 euros. The technical manager in one area of this project has over three and a half thousand emails, and those are just source emails. Plus the opportunity costs at the time. 
the time that you could spend doing other things. The unnecessary testing, not supported by scientific evidence, but have to be done anyway. And I don't wish this presentation to sound like a, an attack on the regulation. The, the objective was admirable. It's just, this is an example of what happens in the process. Obviously the indirect impact suppliers, the effects on them, the changes they make, the restriction on development and innovation. It's so great now that smaller companies just can't afford to stay in the marketplace. And obviously it's a big barrier to entry, excuse me. So the result is it reduces the range of products available with all the costs of active ingredients to get them approved and with all the costs for individual manufacturers of product type 21, they reduce their ranges, obviously. It reduces the range of materials available. I'll say that it discourages innovation. That's an arguable point, but I feel it discourages in, in, innovation and it does definitely provide a barrier to entry. So the result, small companies and big companies alike probably are saying, do we stay in the market? Is it worth it? Can we mitigate these costs and uncertainties? And the way forward probably, or the way forward we found is by working with our industry associations and actually forming commercial, well, uncommercial syndicates with other manufacturers like ourselves wishing to share the costs of going through the approval process. And the competent authority that we're processing our application within the regulations and the constrictions that they have, they're only there to police the law or to implement the law as it is written. The HSE in Bootle, Liverpool were very helpful and have been very communicative. So what we actually need are clear requirements of data, transparently agreed with all stakeholders and a consistent approach from the competent authorities in Europe. Consideration of the risk, not just the hazard. If you drive a car down a motorway in the morning, you're taking, that is a hazard. What is the risk of you having a crash? Um, so we need to consider everything. Over conservatism, it's going to create a problem if we're not careful. A holistic view, a definite time frame, consistent costs, mutual recognition between member states under the BPR to be genuine, and cooperation and partnership to achieve the result. And possibly, what I'm worried about is that the opposite will happen. I'm, I'm not going to go over the screen, but I feel that um, we're spending a lot of time doing a lot of testing and a lot of human resources going into this testing process and a lot of cost and resource and energy is being used to complete a regulatory process, not on R&D. And at the end of the day, if we have an over-conservative approach and the choice on the market is restricted, then we do have a massive risk of invasive species running out of control, which I'm sure the previous speaker made everybody very aware of, and I fully support that. So that's all I'm going to say. Um, an admirable and, and desirable effort to produce a law to provide a level playing field, but those are, in fact, the practical impacts on uh, a business that's been in the manufacturing sector for a long time, and uh, I hope we stay in it for a long time. So thank you very much. So thank you very much. Thanks, Jeff. That was quite a very illuminating and somewhat sobering presentation around the context of this field in our market here in Europe and beyond, perhaps. So I want to hand over now to um, Tom Vance from PML Applications Limited and Will Green from National Biofilms Innovation Centre to just um, take some questions that have been posted and um, initiate a discussion around these topics. So Tom and Will, over to you, please. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, so the first question to come through is one for you, um, Shiva San. It came from Serena Toe at uh, 25 Path. Uh, the AFS Convention, um, we'd like to know, does it cover non-shipping maritime structures such as sea-based aquaculture platforms? Oh, uh, thank you for your uh, questions. Uh, so uh, let me take first uh, question one by one. First question is a uh, cost. Uh, how, uh, what is the cost to register new antifoulant? So uh, actually uh, it's depending on the countries uh, uh, you are going to apply. 
But uh, um, each information uh, I, re uh, I received from uh, antifluorant suppliers, but it's not cheap at all. At least, uh, it's just for example, but it's at least uh, more than 100 million uh, yen. That means uh, 1 million US dollars. And uh, the cost is have been increasing because, for example, in the UK, uh, applicants needed to evaluate whether the new anti falls falls in endocrine disruptors uh, or not. Well, the, we need to check more and more. Then uh, the cost is increasing. But uh, considering that situation, the ISO WG5 uh, established ISO 13073. In the standard, uh, tiered approach is adapted. Uh, for example, uh, at the be uh, beginning stage, the new antifaurants uh, can be placed on the market at uh, relatively, with relatively uh, less data. And uh, after that, uh, business board where them uh, applicant can get more, uh, more money to uh, conduct another test. Then uh, finally, uh, applicant can will be able to get uh, whole data uh, to place uh, their product on the market on all over the world. That's uh, the concept of ISO 13073. I hope it's uh, uh, answer uh, the question, a uh, first question. Thank you. And could you speak to the, um, the second question briefly and then we'll move over to Jeff? Ah, yes. So second question is about the AFS convention. So it's, uh, uh, we should check the definition of the ships. In the AFS Convention, uh, ships of 400 gross tonnage and, and above uh, and engaged in international voyages uh, are degraded. But fixed or floating platforms or uh, floating storage units, uh, floating uh, production storage or something will be uh, are excluded. So uh, I think the Sea-based aquaculture platforms uh, should be excluded uh, uh, from the targets of the convention. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, my name is Tom Vance. I've actually operated a coatings test house. This um, subject is very, very close to my heart. And thank you to both our speakers today. Um, Jeff, I've got a, a question for you. Based on, on what you said and the, the challenges in terms of registration, can we expect any new anti phalanx to be registered in the near future? That's a question from Colin Anderson at 925. Well, it's a good question. I mean, can we expect any new anti phalanx to be registered? At the moment, there's... Um... There's a, there's a backlog, well, I believe there's a backlog in terms of the administration um, of processing all the applications for the existing products. So until we've got through that, um, I can see a lot of, even if somebody were to register a new product, then it would take a long time to go through the pipe chain, if you see what I mean. And I think that the the whole, my whole my whole point was to say that um, the way the regulation is phrased and put together at the moment, the cost of the cost is the cost is, is huge, and it is definitely a barrier to people registering uh, products. So, can we expect any more? I can't say no, um, but what I can say is that I imagine that it's going to be significantly less than would have been the case. Which is a which is a shame um, because again that's a restriction in choice and opportunity, and is that situation going to change um, only if we go back and have a look at the, at the regulation and the way it's policed? Um, 
at source and put that right. So that's my belief. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Jeff. Um, another question for you. In terms of the, type, the types of tests required for the project registration, how useful are they in terms of actually demonstrating the e efficacy of the product and, and showing how well that product will work in service? Have, have we got one set of tests which actually are required for registration and then do you need to do a whole new other set of tests to actually demonstrate to a customer how well the coating works? Or are other tests sort of dual purpose, if that makes sense? Well, yeah, no, that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, the efficacy testing, um, well, we don't know the results yet because um, we haven't had any approval back about the efficacy testing that we do as a business, which um, I think the main thing with efficacy testing is that you can justify it on a scientific and practical basis to the authorities to show that it's a meaningful um, test of the, of the effectiveness of your product. Uh, there's no hard and fast written way of doing it that I'm aware of that I've seen. Um, there are guidance notes, but um, as I say, as long as they're scientific, it's okay. And in fact, we use the same, the efficacy testing we've put in with applications has been part of the process of testing a product in the field as well. So we have field tests and unfield tests, if you like. So. No, we don't have specific testing for the regulation, and except in efficacy, but if you let me move on to other areas, there are some very specific tests which need to be done, some of which are, I would question the need for, and they're very, very expensive um, in terms of the effects on human health and in terms of the effect on the environment. Um, so there are some question marks in that area. Efficacy and uh, is one where, we're almost allowed to put forward uh, within parameters, as long as it's scientific, our own approach to the problem. So I hope that helps, Tom. Hope that helps. Okay. Yeah, thanks for that, Jeff. All right, I'll pass over to Will. Thanks very much. We've had another question come through um, about copper, and I think it's it's one for both of our, our speakers to, to answer. So I'll go through the question first and hand over to perhaps Shiba-san first. So the, the question comes from Tibby Stan um, about copper-free anti-fouling coatings for commercial vessels uh, and the regulations around that. And they want to know, do you see any future regulations coming um, from the IMO ban it or mandating copper-free anti-foulings or um, banning copper? And to your knowledge, is there currently any local regulator having a requirement for copper-free coatings in place? So yes, if I hand over to, to Shiba-san to answer that one, and then we can switch over to Jeff for his opinion after that. Okay, uh, thank you uh, for the new question. It's de uh, depending on the uh, nature of the uh, uh, characteristic of the antifoulant, but uh, also the use and uh, how much uh, the Antifoulant is used is also a, a big factor. Then, uh, as a result of risk assessment, the risk is not acceptable. Then, approved, approved to be accept, unacceptable. Then, uh, people should, or we should uh, consider how to regulate uh, the, the antifoulant. So, uh, kappa free or not is not, doesn't matter. So, uh, we should, we should consider uh, uh, all factors, all situations, then uh, uh, we should conclude uh, very, very discreetly. That's my opinion, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, Jeff, have you got anything to add about um, what you think the fate of copper-based anti foulants are in the EU market? Well, I would agree with my colleague. I think that it's the overall evidence and criteria that are far more important than just targeting copper. Um, what I can say is that if you have an anti, if you make an anti fouling claim of a product, if it has absolutely no actives in it at all, you still have to register the product. It still has to go the test has to go through the testing process. That's my understanding of it. But what matters is that we get products out that, that are effectitious and, um, and, and look at the risk and the hazard and, and balance that up. So if you're asking me specifically about a couple, you could say that about a lot of things. So I, I don't think you can, 
I don't think you could possibly focus just on copper. At the moment, copper is a, a key part in the process, but that doesn't mean to say it will or won't be in the future. It just depends on how the risk assessment and the hazard are looked at in the future. Thank you very much, Jeff. Over to you, Tom. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm just mindful of time, but I'd like to ask one um, question to both our speakers about innovation and how they see the regulatory framework um, influencing regulate, um, innovation in, in the market. Um, Shibsan, could you give me your sort of, um, sort of summarised view on how you think the current regulatory status is influencing innovation? Are we likely to see new and um, more exciting products and, and biofilm control products on the market, or do you think we're, we're sort of killing them off one by one? And then I'd like to ask the same question to Jeff afterwards, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, as I said, uh, that's the first question. Uh, the barrier to uh, place a new uh, anti fouling in the market is very, very high. So, uh, it's uh, in a sense uh, prohibits or uh, obstructs a new uh, effort to place a new product, new anti fault in the market. Then uh, we should consider how to uh, make the barrier uh, to uh, control to uh, reasonable level. Because uh, we should use, uh, we, uh, we should consider uh, the variety of uh, anti -fault. That means uh, if we, uh, try to prohibit uh, the use of anti one by one thing, uh, we, our choice, uh, we, can choo we cannot choose uh, anti in the future. Then uh, once one or two bias uh, anti uh, remains, then uh, risk, uh, risk will increase because uh, the amount of uh, such a uh, by uh, the use of such a uh, anti fouling we would increase uh, eventually. Then we need to uh, consider how to uh, diverse uh, and how to uh, lower the risk of uh, the total risk of biocide anti fouling use. Then, uh, as I said, uh, we should consider how to use ISO one three or seven three or uh, similar approaches. To, uh, to allow uh, new biocide, new antifarant to uh, in, uh, enter into market. Thank you. Thank you, Chief And And uh, yeah, same question to, to Jeff. Jeff, where do you think we're going in terms of innovation? I think you've got some, some views on that. I'm keen to hear them. Well, um, I, I think that the, as, we, as we we're both really saying, that there is a the cost of compliance with the regulations is uh, providing a big barrier to entry into the marketplace. And um, so if you're, so it does, it, it, it squashes, it, it's in danger of, um, of crushing innovation. All the resources that are applied to comply with the regulation is another issue. The opportunity cost of those human resources that go into complying over conservative, overbearing regulation will reduce the time, the manpower, the resource time available to develop new products. And so, yes, it's a barrier to entry. Yes, it is uh, in its current form, it is crushing, it is slowing up uh, innovation and development. And that applies to all bar sides, really. It's, it's making it very, very expensive and it's restricting what people can do. So, I would argue that, that if the regulation could be reviewed and brought into a more consistent and understandable and uh, it could be discussed by all interesting stakeholders, then we might be able to uh, get it back to the point whereby people can actually look and see a way through it. At the moment, you're looking at a, at a huge barrier, a huge wall of cost, technical requirement, and more to the point, unknown and inconsistent approaches. Again, I'm talking specifically about the 
Investment and money might be able to see a way through to a return at the end of it. At the moment, it's just putting a block on everything. Okay, thanks very much, Jeff. Um, we've got time for one very quick question. Um, this is a question coming in. Say, what is the deadline to have an anti-fouling product authorised under ET21? If not authorised, when do you have to stop selling the product? Are you asking me then? <laughs> yeah, if, you, if you've got a quick answer for that, yeah. If if, if not, if, then we can move on. It was just uh, a question that came up. Infinity. Well, there's a. At the moment, I'm not aware of too many products that have actually gone through the process. I'm aware that, um, well, I can talk about in the, in the UK as an example, the existing care of pesticide regulations have been mis in effect or rescinded at the end of this year because there was a three year run in period. So they finish and officially speaking, any product that hasn't been approved under BPR in the UK. Um, won't be able to be sold, but in actual fact, because of the time frame, because of Brexit, because of COVID-19 and all the delays and all the inconsistencies and all the problems and the time, um, there is an open book approach to that in that one regulation will maintain itself while the other one comes in. So if you get, once you, if you fail to get an approval for your product, then you're looking at uh, now, there's so many dates in my head. I don't know if I can remember exactly what it is. I think it's six months and then six months. So you'll have six months to manufacture through, six months to supply it to the market, and then six months to use off. So you're looking at an 18-month run-out period. Um, but okay. I, that would probably need checking because um, there's been so much shunting around. So those are the official figures. But at the moment, the timeframes have all been opened out a lot because there is so much work and so many applications and the competent authorities are snowed under and they've been restricted because of the current situation. So. Okay, thanks, so, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so in, I'm conscious of time. I realise there was another question that came in from um, Serena. If that's okay, we will put that to our panellists and send you the email um, answer offline, Serena. So we're just running out of time a little bit. Um, but thanks very much for your questions and for the panelists for their answers. Um, if I could hand over to uh, Stefan to wrap the meeting up. Thank you, William. Uh, so then for me, um, just to say thank you so much to our two speakers. Very interesting and informative presentations and being part of the discussion. And thank you all for attending. Uh, we have two more uh, webinars in this series. And um, here is one on the screen for you now, um, which uh, is on the 26th of, of October. And there is a time change then, um, so that uh, it'll be the same time in the UK, but it will be then one hour later, so 5 p.m. Uh, in, in Singapore. We will proceed to discuss the challenges and opportunities of, of these biocide regulations from an industrial perspective. So, so with that, uh, I will close for today and look forward to sort of see you again um, on the 26th uh, of October of, of our webinar series. Thank you sir, so much. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>